Does e-learning benefit all learners? This is the question I ask you today. My name is Aisha Abdul Sitar from the University of South Africa. In view of the pandemic that we're all going through and the move to e-learning that we have transitioned to, I ask you this question in order to consider the aspect of digital exclusion in e-learning contexts. What I will also discuss is how UDL can be used to overcome the challenges of digital exclusion. Well, in the e-learning context, the things that I would like to discuss are digital inclusion, digital exclusion, digital access, digital literacy, and UDL to the rescue. These are all interrelated concepts that I will discuss one at a time. Firstly, digital inclusion. What does this mean? It means having access to and also having the knowledge of important technologies and applications for effective e-learning. Well then, what does digital exclusion refer to? Digital exclusion means the lack of access to and or knowledge of pertinent technologies and applications to switch to online learning. This is what we refer to as the digital divide, which is extremely real. So what do we understand by the digital divide? There are two aspects that we need to understand to be able to understand what we mean by the digital divide, and that is access and accessibility. What is the difference? Access refers to the ability to fully participate in the digital society, which includes access to tools and technologies such as the internet and computers that allow for full participation in e-learning. There are two aspects to digital access. Infrastructure, which refers to the development of areas and localities to facilitate access to the internet, pertinent for e-learning and access to digital devices. This means the ownership of or the loan of these devices through community centers or rentals. And when we talk of digital devices, we talk of laptops, tablets, mobile phones, etc., that are vital for e-learning. Well then, what does accessibility mean then? Accessibility refers to the ability of a website, mobile application, or electronic document to be easily navigated and understood by a wide range of users, including those users who have visual, auditory, motor, or cognitive disabilities. Accessibility, in other words, is useful to persons with disabilities. Example, in the form of assistive technologies, devices and applications, such as screen readers for visually impaired individuals, for example, and also website and learning management system compliance to accessibility guidelines, such as the web content accessibility guidelines. Are any of our LMSs, LMSs actually compatible with these guidelines? I think many learning management systems are not compatible with these guidelines and many websites are also not compatible with these guidelines. So we need to familiarize ourselves with these guidelines before we switch to e-learning or try and integrate these changes while we're moving towards e-learning. This is a question I want you all to ponder on. Is the digital divide only applicable to the global south? Or are there issues of the digital divide in the global north? This is something that we all need to think about. Well, now that we've discussed digital inclusion and digital exclusion, I go into digital access. Although we've touched on it earlier, I want to go into the statistics and what do the numbers say about digital access? Well, how do people around the world access digital technologies and the internet? What do the statistics say? And how does this change the way in which we switch to e-learning? 
The Global Digital Population Index of 2020 actually indicates that 60% of the global population has some form of digital access. This figure worries me a bit. Although we say 60% of the global population has some form of digital access, it means that 40% of the global population does not have access to digital, uh, to digital uh, technologies. So what does this mean? That of those 40% that do not have access, some of them are in your classroom. And what do we do with those learners who do not have digital access? This is the, the graph that was displayed earlier. It's just a bit clearer. What's really important here is that we see that active mobile internet users worldwide is 4.2 billion people. And this is the latest statistics in April 2020. So this tells us a lot of important information. It indicates that many users are using mobile technologies to actually access the internet, which gives us an indication of how to implement our e-learning strategies. Now, we need to know the concentration of mobile usage around the world. Well, the statistics show that Latin America, Africa, and the MENA region, that's the Middle East and North African regions, actually show the highest concentration of mobile usage in the world. This is a summary of some of the basic statistics that were important to me on internet usage worldwide. In Europe and North America, people spend more time accessing the internet via computers and tablets than they do via mobile phones. In all other regions, more online time is spent on mobiles. In Latin America, the average time spent on mobile phones is four and a half hours um, a day. So th this is really important statistics. Internet access in the EU, over the past 10 years, the share of households with access to the internet in the European Union has increased steadily to reach 90% in 2019. Well, the figures were different just back in 2007, where 55% of EU households had internet access. So this shows the changing trends in internet usage in Europe. Well, Africa shows a different statistic altogether. If you look at this graph, internet users in Africa in 2019, there's a staggering difference between different countries. Like Nigeria, for instance, has a high penetration of internet users, but Libya is right at the bottom with low concentration of internet users. So we're seeing different statistics in different parts of Africa. Now I'm going into South Africa because this is the context of UNISA. So we need to understand our population first. So the digital population in South Africa in 2020, active internet users is 36.5 million users. This is around about 58% of our population. And of that, we see active mobile internet users is almost all of the people that have active, active internet uh, usage they are accessing the internet via mobile technology. So that's 34.93 million people. So this gives us a lot of information about how to uh, draft our e-learning strategies. All right, so what we're seeing is that mobile technologies are penetrating the market. The statistics show that clearly. Mobile internet usage is also increasing. Mobile technologies, provide a solution to the challenges of poor infrastructure in South Africa and possibly in the region as well. Costs of access to mobile technologies and mobile internet connections are much more affordable. So we've already gone through all the statistics worldwide. Now we're going to the next step, which is digital literacy. So what do we understand by digital literacy? This means the ability to access, manage, understand, integrate, communicate, evaluate, and create information safely and appropriately through digital devices and network technologies for a purpose. Example, e-learning or e-commerce. Our purpose is e-learning at the moment. 
Digital literacy also encompasses competences that are variously referred to as computer literacy, ICT literacy, information literacy, and media literacy. Now let's see some information about the worldwide statistics on digital literacy. And then we talk about the digital literacy global framework. Worldwide, I'll give you a small review of digital uh, literacy globally. There's a lack of comprehensive statistics on digital literacy in each country. But some of the statistics that we do have, they actually reveal that the lack of digital skills and literacy is a barrier to internet access in North Africa. For example, there was a survey done in Egypt in 2015, which showed that 38% of people in Egypt did not use the internet due to the lack of digital skills and literacy. So this leads to not accessing the internet because of fear of it due to lack of knowledge. In another statistic, we're seeing a report by the Pew Research Center, which found that 40% of American adults lack basic technological skills and knowledge. In another part of the world, in Russia, the statistics published in January 2020 revealed that individuals displayed low levels of competence in digital content creation. So we're seeing all different aspects of digital literacy or digital illiteracy in different parts of the world. But although these are scant results, but we're seeing some important trends here. Now, there's a digital literacy global framework, which was established or is established by the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. And they are trying to identify assessment tools to monitor digital literacy skills. And these are some of the important points that we should consider when we implement e-learning. The framework features seven competence areas. The first is fundamentals of hardware and software, information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital content creation, safety on, on the internet, problem solving, and career-related competences. These are all related to digital literacy. So let's see the DLG framework. These are some important documents that you can read on your own. There's a blog called Digital Literacy Skills from a Framework to a Measure, and that's uh, actually analyzing the entire framework from UNESCO. And the framework itself, a global framework of reference on digital literacy skills for indicator 4.4.2. This is a PDF document that you can peruse to understand more about digital literacy. Now the big question, do your students have these digital literacy competencies? Or do they not? How does this change your e-learning strategy? Finally, we come to UDL to the rescue. All right. We understand now that digital exclusion is a problem, but how do we solve this? We can use the basic principles of UDL to actually come to the rescue. So the universal design of learning anticipates barriers to learning. In the same way, it will anticipate digital exclusion due to digital literacy and digital access issues. And we should envision this in such a way that we plan for the use of different modes of instruction and assessment. So what does UNISA do differently? So the University of South Africa is an open distance and e-learning institution. So although we've been open distance and e-learning, we use a blended mode of tuition and assessment. This means that we use a lot of the postal service, we use a lot of uh, venue-based examinations, but this all had to change with the pandemic. So, and besides that, we have students that have various issues with digital exclusion in terms of access and literacy. And that's when UNISA created all these uh, digital centers and access centers for students, but these are not accessible now due to the pandemic. So what did we do? So the strategy. 
Because of the pandemic, venue-based examinations have been cancelled, so we have hundreds of thousands of students writing examinations during the June examination period. This is actually mid-semester for us, mid-year for us, this mid-year semester. So we, you, we went completely online with examinations. Some modules do write portfolio exams, so that continues, but now most of the other modules that write venue-based exams all around the world. We've used timed examinations online with different durations for various modules. We have an online academic integrity declaration that students have to fill in before submitting the examination. Various training programs have been provided for students to train them in the use of these new formats and tools. Lecturers have also been trained. Students unable to access the examination in this semester due to whatever access issues or whatever other issues, they will get automatic deferment to the next semester's examination in October, November. What opportunity did we see? We've seen that students have wide scale access to mobile devices. So the university has signed contracts with various mobile network and service providers to provide free data for students from May to July 2020. The university is using varied online examination formats and tools that can be used on different devices. So these were all the opportunities we've seen and that we've taken advantage of for this semester's exams. And the investment, what investment did UNISA make? UNIS, uni, uh, the university is investing millions of rands to extend this offer of free data to approximately 390,000 students. Also, what UNISA did, they sent out a survey to all its students a few weeks back, asking them which data service provider they use, which cell phone number they use, which device they'll be using for the exam. So they gain, uh, gained all that data. And through that data usage, they've actually drawn up these contracts with all the network service providers and they've uh, utilized all these different tools and techniques. So I ask you, what measures are your institution putting in place to swiftly switch to e-learning? This is an important article that actually shows how UNISA has moved towards online uh, examinations and how they're providing free data to all students. So now the question remains, do we still experience any challenges? The simple answer is yes. We are all learning as we go along. We are struggling, we are all finding our feet, we are all learning new tools and techniques, we are learning new things every day, we're trying to support each other as colleagues, we're trying to answer students as best as we can, we're trying to allay their fears as best as we can. And that's why we see the need for this transnational collaboratory where we share our experiences and practices to help each other move more swiftly and more efficiently to the e-learning platform. Uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them now. Keep well and take care.